Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Those Who Inspire Me and Why with Brooks Jensen. I'm Avril Christensen from the Digital Imaging Group Committee, and I'd like to extend a very warm, warm welcome to all of you here today. At the moment, I think we've got about 252 people. In addition to the Digital Imaging Group members, we have RPS members and non-members from all over the world here today. Before we start, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items with you. This Zoom event is going to be a bit different today because you're going to be able to ask questions all the way through the presentation. Brooks isn't going to answer them straight away. Um, now, there is a chat feature, uh, it's called questions and answers, and you'll see it at the bottom of your screen. It could be at the top of your screen if you're using a tablet. Click on it and you'll be able to see where you can write in a question. We'll keep all these questions throughout the presentation and then at the end, I will ask them on your behalf of Brooks. Could I ask you a favour though? Please don't ask, send your thanks to Brooks. I know that he's going to be so good that you're all going to want to say how brilliant he is. Um, but we will send out a feedback form to you that you can fill in and we will pass all of your thanks and your appreciations on to Brooks. The talk um, will, you can ask questions as they come to you throughout the presentation and I'll ask these at Brooks. Um, so it's a great pleasure now for me to introduce Brooks Jensen to you. Brooks is a fine art photographer, a publisher, a workshop teacher, and a writer. Brooks is possibly the most quoted living photographer. He's the owner and co-founder, editor, and publisher of the award-winning Lenswork, with sus subscribers in 72 countries, Brooke Jensen's impact on fine art photography is worldwide. His podcast is his podcast and, and photography and the creative process is heard daily by thousands. Lens work is currently in its 27th year of publication and lens work online is a membership website with literally terabytes of online content, including videos, audios, workshops, and inspiration for the creative photographer. Brooks has written 10 best-selling books on photography and creativity. Brooks Jensen. I couldn't find. I'd like to hand over to you now, and just really looking forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thank you, Avril. That was that was a very nice introduction, and welcome everyone uh, to this little talk called "Those Who Inspire Me and Why." Let me uh, flip over to my screen here. Hopefully, you can all see that now. Um, there's there's a backstory to this uh, talk, which I think is is sort of fun. So I'd like to begin by sharing that. I, I've been a photographer since. Oh, the 1970s, and uh, only became a publisher fairly late in life. I'll be a photographer long after I stop publishing. Photography is my passion. Photography is what I love to do. And every year, I have a, a friend who goes photographing with me out in um, the western half of the United States. We love the desert, and we were talking shop as you do with your photo buddies and peers, and. And um, somehow the idea of inspiration came up. And um, he said, who, he asked me, who, who inspires you photographically? And I said, well, boy, that, that's such an interesting question and such a difficult one to answer. But certainly those of us who are landscape photographers uh, certainly have to be inspired by Ansel Adams. But I explained that I have a different reason for being inspired by Ansel Adams than most people do. And, and that is, it, it wasn't so much his imagery that inspired me. Terrific, I love it, but it's not the kind of imagery that I, I would aspire to do. But that I was really inspired 
by his connection with everyday people outside of photographic circles. Ansel Adams is probably the only photographer I know who passes what I call the airport test. If, if you go to any airport and ask a hundred random people walking through the airport, uh, name me a famous novelist, they can probably name you quite a number. Name me a famous musician, they can probably name quite a number. Name for me a famous fine art photographer, they'll probably give you one name, and that's Ansel Adams. And, and the, the fact that he connected so strongly with people outside of photographic circles, for me, is a tremendous inspiration. A lot of photographers tend to connect within the photographic community. That's great. Nothing wrong with that. But I, I think as, as photographers and as uh, people who are trying to say something with our creative craft outside the world of photography, there is a, a lot of people who are not involved in photography who might find interest in our artwork. So that's why Ansel Adams inspires me. And my friend said, you know, you ought to write a book about that. <laughs> and so I started thinking about those who inspire me and why, and that, that has developed into a sizable project, which is available now on my, uh, uh, on our Lenswork Online website. Um, and I, I'm adding to it every week about various photographers and why they inspire me. And uh, so that, that's what I'm gonna talk about today is a few of those. Uh, I should explain a little bit about lens work just in case uh, you're not familiar with it and probably not all of you are. Um, my wife and I were both photographers when we met and um, uh, like, again, all photographers do, we started talking shop and she asked me, uh, what magazines do you subscribe to? And I said, uh, you know, I don't subscribe to any photography magazine. She said, why not? And I said, because photography magazines tend to be about cameras. And I'm not particularly interested in cameras. I'm interested in photographs. I'm interested in the creative process of making photographs. But the, the devices are of less appeal to me. I'm not a camera collector. I'm not, I'm not a big camera person. And she said, well, um, what magazine would you like to subscribe to if such a one existed? I said, oh, I can show you exactly what it is that I like. And I, I pulled out one of my collection of the Aperture magazines from the early 1950s when Minor White was editing it. And I said, this is what I think is uh, something I would like to subscribe to because it's all about pictures and it's all about the creative process. And in those days, they included some poetry and things but nothing about cameras, nothing about techniques. It was all about the result of the creative process. And she said, well, why don't we make a magazine that does that? So in 1993, we started Lenswork. In 2005, we added a computer version of that that's PDF. In 2011, we, we added a tablet version. We now pr publish a number of books and, um, we're having more fun than, than you can imagine in uh, photography, in sharing the work of photographers, not just the famous photographers, but we like to publish people who are doing interesting work. We don't care if they're famous. We don't care if they've never been published before. As a matter of fact, one of our points of pride is we never read people's curriculum vitae. <laughs> we always just look at the photographs and we publish the ones that we think that our readers might be interested in seeing. So that's a little bit about who Lenswork is. In 2011, we started Lenswork Online primarily because we have so many people overseas who are interested in the content of what we do, but the postage is such a problem with an expensive and made the subscription price so expensive that we started doing Lenswork Online for downloadable uh, copies of the magazine and that allowed us to add all kinds of things audio and video literally terabytes of information and so uh, the talk that I'm going to give uh, called those who inspire me and why is all on lens work online and each photographer is its own little audio and why they inspire me and so that's a little bit about who I am and why I'm here is 
uh, and was happy to receive the invitation from RPS to talk. So here's a number of people that I, I want to talk about. And the lessons that I learned from them, the first of which is my life partner, my wife, Maureen Gallagher, when she said, why don't we start a magazine? My first reaction was, we don't know anything about <laughs> publishing a magazine. We don't have the foggiest idea what to do and all the steps that are involved and et cetera. And she said, well, we'll learn, we'll do it. And I thought, you know, that is strangely enough, the essence of the creative process. You and I as photographers, we, we want to say something, we want to communicate something, we want to create something interesting. But almost by definition, we don't know how to do it unless we're merely copying some other photographer, in which case, you know, it's fun, it's great, it's worth doing, I, I, said, I certainly recommend it. But if we're going to pioneer something that's never been seen before and share something that really comes from deep within us, we probably don't know how to do that. And if we let don't, if we let the fact that we don't know how to do it get in the way, we'll probably never do it. So jumping in is the first aspect of the creative process. And so when Maureen said, let's learn how to do a, a magazine, the first thing I did was I bought a computer and, and I thought, well, this will be good because I, I sort of need to learn about this new thing in 1993 called desktop publishing. And the first thing I did was get a piece of software called Publish It, which I've joked ever since then that you have to say very slowly and carefully. <laughs> and we learned how to put together a magazine and thanks to my wife, Maureen, uh, here we are celebrating our 28th year. The first thing we did, of course, is we went out and bought a press. And you can see that I um, first learned how to put ink all over me before I learned how to put ink on paper. And um, by the way, that's one of Mo's modeling props in the background, the leg in there. That always gets a, a chuckle from people. We published the first 11 issues of Lenswork ourselves on this little press in our garage and until it sort of took off and we began uh, printing with commercial printers and offering it uh, by subscription around the world. And like I say, now we've been doing this for 28 years. We've won a number of awards and it's been very rewarding, but the most important rewarding part for me is not the business success, although I'm happy about that. The most important part is we've had the opportunity to publish at this point, I think it's a little over 500 photographers, and I've interviewed most of them, and I've got to know them, and I've developed friendships with photographers around the world, and it's been fantastic. So that was the first inspiration and why. The second photographer I want to talk about who's been in, incredibly inspirational in my life is Pedro Meyer. Now, Pedro Meyer, some of you are probably familiar with Pedro Meyer. He's a Mexican photographer, and... Pedro Meyer is uh, not nearly as well known globally as I think he deserves to be because he's really, really a terrific photographer. But here's why he inspired me is that I, I was wandering around in a bookstore and I saw um, in the software section of the bookstore a little box that had a disc and Pedro Meyer had published this thing that had a CD in it that you could put in your computer and see a presentation of his photographs. And that was so different from what I was taught. Uh, like most of you, I suspect, uh, I was taught that a particularly a fine art photograph or a gallery kind of presentation was something that you did like this. You put it in a white mat board. You made a physical print. You signed it in the corner. Maybe you numbered it in the other corner. And there were certain rules and expectations that we all were taught to follow. For example, um, don't under, uh, under the worst possible circumstances, do not use a mat board color other than white. I, I don't know why. I can't explain it. But but that's sort of 
If you walk into a gallery with blue mat board, they'll laugh at you. Don't use a uh, two ply mat board. You have to use four ply mat board. And so bevel cut around the photograph. Uh, we uh, make our fine art uh, photographs this way. And there was sort of a thing that you did. And this was the way I was taught to do photography. And it was the only way to do photography. And as a matter of fact, in my youth, if there wasn't a print, there wasn't a photograph that the, the print and the photograph were the same thing. We used the words interchangeably. Um, the word image occasionally would get used, but mostly we talked about prints and photographs, but Pedro Meyer didn't. Pedro Meyer made this disc that was a story of his parents who were elderly and his father got cancer and his mother was taking care of him. And this disc contained a multimedia audio visual presentation with voiceover by Pedro Meyer telling about his father's battle with cancer. And in the middle of his father's battle with cancer, his mother got cancer and they both passed away within a very short period of time. And he told this very, powerful, moving story without a print, only on the screen. Now keep in mind, this was probably in, I'm, I'm going to guess maybe it was 1976 or something like that, shortly after we began publishing lens work. And even publishing lens work, we were all about ink on paper, the printed magazine, etc. But here Pedro Meyer had done something that was fascinating. And so what he taught me that was amazing, uh, that opened up all kinds of doors in my life was the idea that uh, a photograph can be a print, but it doesn't have to be a print. That we were entering a new age in which alternative presentation ideas like multimedia CDs, or now we have multimedia downloads and that kind of thing, were another way to connect our photographs and our ideas about life and creativity. It was another way to connect with the world outside of the print. And for me, that was a revelation. I still make prints. I still make uh, what I call folios. We'll talk about those. And chat books, we'll talk about those in a little bit too. I still make physical things. But Pedro Meyer allowed me to open the door to non-physical presentation of photographs. And essentially what he did, and th this was the key idea, is he liberated the idea between a photograph and an image. And so ever since Pedro Myers uh, educating me with this product, uh, I've begun to think more and more about images. And an image is something we can use in a variety of media. Uh, I've, I've done a lecture I call the spectrum in which I propose that any given project that you might do photographically, let's say you've done, you know, uh, something that has uh, 15 or 20 images in it, that project could be manifest in ever so many different media today. We live in the age of media alternatives, and that's a huge thing, um, and that any given project might live in a variety of media, not just a disc or not just a gallery exhibition or not just a print. It might be all of those simultaneously with variations for the media based on uh, the, the audience and who's going to consume that. Speaking of that, one of the things that I've learned about media through lens work is that the audience has segmented also. And so we have an audience for our printed magazine. And lots of those people could care less that we have a downloadable version that goes on a tablet, for example. But the people who love the tablet edition could care less that we have a version on print. I think there's a lesson for us photographers there, that if we think of ourselves as printmakers, which I certainly did for the longest period of time, if we think of ourselves only as printmakers, we box ourselves in. So there's lots to think about there. Um, let me go to the third photographer I want to talk about, and that's Jerry Yulesman. Here again, some of you are probably familiar with Jerry Yulesman. He's quite famous for his recombinant imagery. Here's Jerry Yulesman and Maureen 
together a number of years ago. We published Jerry Yulesman way, way, way back in Lenswork number 17. And Jerry Yulesman is famous for his recombinant imagery. Long before digital photography, he would take bits and pieces of various negatives, exposures and negatives, and he would, through darkroom magic that is miraculous to observe, he would combine various pieces of negatives into a fanciful image. So you'd have a person with angel wings hovering above a lake, that, that kind of thing. Doing it all with multiple enlargers, multiple negatives in the darkroom, all analog. And I asked him during my interview if he was thinking about how he would use the parts of an exposure while he was in the field with his camera. Was he thinking about, I could use this thing somehow in a recombinant image? He said, no, no, no. He said, when I'm out in the field, I'm not thinking about finished artwork at all. He said, when I'm in the field, all I'm doing is gathering assets. It was a revelation to me because I had absorbed all of the Ansel Adams philosophy about pre-visualization the idea that you should know in your mind's eye exactly what the image would look like before you click the shutter so that you could predict how you wanted to develop the film and expose the film and all that kind of stuff. And Jerry Yulesman put all that aside and said, no, no, no. The artwork happens back in the studio. Well, that made sense for him because he was doing recombinant imagery. But strangely enough, it made sense for me too because I was interested in storytelling and putting together groups of images, a lot of times with a little bit of text to go with it. And all of that happened back on the computer, back here at home, not out in the field. So his idea of gathering assets became a huge thing for me and literally changed the way that I was thinking about where the art making happened and what I was doing in the field. And strangely enough, it liberated me in the field because instead of trying to be there in front of a scene in the landscape and figure out where I wanted to, you know, frame it and expose it and dodge it and burn it and all the things I was going to have to do in the dark room and focus on all of that uh, technical thing of getting the exposure right, Jerry Yulesman taught me to just respond, just allow my heart to respond and photograph whatever was there and then figure out what to do with it later. Because his implication was trust your inner muse, trust your subconscious, that if, if, if you respond to something in the world, then photograph it because you've responded to it and then figure out how to present it, figure out how to finish it, figure out how to use it later in a project. So the idea of gathering assets became an incredibly important inspiration for me and literally changed the way that I, that I work. Here's a good example. I was in a, a place called uh, Fort Warden, which is an old World War I battery, uh, artillery battery. This now been turned into a state park here in the state of Washington where I live. And the kids go in there, you know, and they write graffiti on the walls and the park rangers come in and cover up all the graffiti with all of this writing. And, and they just brush strokes, just random brush strokes to cover up the, the graffiti and whatnot. But when I looked at it, I thought it kind of looks like um, Chinese or Japanese calligraphy not not exactly but sort of and so I photographed it like crazy just because I was responding to it and then later I created a project called Wakari Masen which is Japanese for I don't understand because it looks like something I should be able to read but because I don't understand the language I can't this uh, you see me standing in front of the walls a number of years ago this little splash of paint uh, right here I don't know if you can see my mouse or not that became something that I used in the covers of my books. So gathering assets, that's the idea from Jerry Yulesman. Photographer number four I want to talk about is David Bales. Um, and every opportunity I have, and I'll take the opportunity here, I recommend 
a, a little book that I think is a mandatory read for all photographers, written by David Bales and Ted Orland. And if, if, you've not, if you're not familiar with them, they're both brilliant writers, brilliant artists uh, on the West Coast of America. Ted Orland was an Ansel Adams uh, darkroom assistant for a while. David Bales is a brilliant workshop teacher. And they, they wrote a book called Art and Fear. If you know the book, you know why uh, I'm so high on this. But if you're interested in the process of being a creative visual artist, whether it's photography or painting or whatever, th this book is, is just excellent. It's a very thin book. It, it won't take you long to read it. It will take you your lifetime to absorb it. And so please uh, uh, just take my recommendation on this one. This is something I think every photographer should read. Well, David Bales is a great workshop instructor. This is David here on the left. I attended a workshop and he was talking about <clears throat> project oriented photography. And he shared with all of us what I thought was a brilliant uh, idea about finding a project, and it goes something like this, that you probably have, every one of you probably have some really fascinating projects in your archives, but maybe you don't know it. They're hidden in there. It's sort of, uh, as David used to call it, it's like searching for a needle in a stack of needles. Um, and this is how he suggested you could do so. He said, take a pile of prints, or now you could take, uh, you could do this in a collection in Lightroom, for example, but uh, take a pile of prints, and uh, the bigger st the stack, the better, and come up with a criteria to divide that one pile of prints into two piles of prints. So take, for example, all the ones that are horizontal landscape orientation over here, and all the ones that are uh, portrait orientation, vertical ones over here. Divide the stack and see if anything happens to you. If nothing happens to you, don't worry about it. Put them all back together, shuffle them all up again, come up with another criteria. All the ones that are black and white, all the ones that are color. Nothing happens, put them back together. All the ones that have curvy lines, all the ones that have rectilinear lines of composition divide the pile, see if anything happens. If it doesn't, put it back together. Keep thinking of various criteria. Distant shots, short shots. Shallow depth of field, great depth of field. Uh, Man-made objects, natural objects. Think of everything you can to divide the pile into two. And he, he proposed, and he's right, he said, guaranteed, eventually, you will divide your pile in half and say, oh my God, look at that. There it is. And the hair on the back of your neck will stand up and you'll recognize a project that perhaps your subconscious mind, perhaps the creative muse has motivated you to make those pictures, but you didn't recognize them as a project because it was a needle in a stack of needles. This method of finding a project is uh, it, it just, it never fails. I've, I've been teaching this for years. And here's an example. I'll go back to the, to the Fort Warden and the Wakari Masen project earlier. I had literally about 900 photographs of this painted brushstrokes graffiti on the walls. And I'm dividing them using the David Bales idea, dividing them into two piles. And I ran across this one. And I thought, oh, there's a way to divide them. All the ones that look like calligraphy, you know, Japanese or Chinese calligraphy, all the ones that don't. And suddenly the project was there because I found I had lots of little squiggles of paint that looked as though they could be communicating something. And I found that project using the David Bales uh, pile of prints idea. So I would encourage you to try this. Go back, look at all of your negatives, look at your contact sheets, look in your Lightroom catalog and see if you can find a criteria to separate out all of your images and discover something that's in there that you didn't even know was in there.
I discovered this one, and this has now become a folio. Uh, I mentioned folios earlier, just real quickly. Um, a folio is, to me, an idea that is sort of halfway between fine art that goes on the wall and a book. Um, it, it's something that I came up with as an idea to present my work because books are expensive. In, in my youth, I, I just couldn't afford to go pay to have a commercially printed book done. And this was obviously long before blurb and print on demand and those kinds of things. So I came up with the idea of making individual prints. The early ones were gelatin silver from the wet dark room. Now I, I use primarily inkjet. Individual prints on a piece of paper, but not matted. But you can see sort of printed so that there's a mat board like surrounding. And then all of those enclosed in an art paper cover so that it becomes a thing. And it's an ideal way to show 10, 15, 20 images in a group that feel like a book and are consumed kind of like a book, but they're not bound. So uh, anyway, that's what a folio is. Moving on. Uh, number five of those who inspire me and why is interestingly enough, Hokusai. Hokusai is, of course, the famous uh, Japanese woodblock printer. What does he have to do with photography? And he's most famous for this image, which I'm, I'm sure most of you are probably aware of and have seen. It's become a popular icon as well as a wonderful piece of art. Hokusai, however, was inspirational to me for this idea. In Japanese culture, uh, woodblock prints, which are known as ukiyo-e, were created not as artwork necessarily. They're not a fine art the way you and I would think of a fine art. They were made for everyday people, and they were sold for very inexpensive prices. What you and I would think is, you know, pennies for a print. And they would print them up uh, because they're woodblock prints, they could print them up, uh, lots and lots and lots of them, and they were sold to the masses for an inexpensive price. It was art on one of the most democratic um, uh, co commercial paradigms that you could possibly think of. And I was inspired by that. Photography has become um, more and more expensive over the years, particularly starting with uh, the 1970s when the, the world of galleries discovered photography. This all goes way, way back to Stieglitz, of course, in the 19 teens. But, um, but really photography began to be collectible in the 70s when um, a lot of museums discovered that their budgets were stressed so they couldn't buy paintings but they could buy photography because there was so much less than paintings. And so a lot of uh, museums around the world started collecting photography, which drove the prices up, which drove most of us out of the photography market. I would suspect that there are many, many of you listening to this who um, are maybe really hesitant to pay a lot of money for a print. You might trade with some friends, you have your own work on the wall. But photography has become an expensive commodity for something that is, for all intents and purposes, infinitely reproducible. I always get a chuckle out of photographers that put the, that limit on their print, you know, one slash five or something, because they're limiting how many they can make when photography is the ultimately reproducible medium. For me, Hokusai became an inspiration because I realized that by selling inexpensive prints that were easily reproduced, which is exactly what photography is, that he could connect with a much larger audience. And now, in fact, a global audience. And even to this day, you can buy an original Hokusai print for probably less than you can buy a photograph in an average gallery. So the idea of that Hokusai taught me and all of the ukiyo-e artists from Japan was the idea of connecting with an audience through making inexpensive artwork that could be easily reproduced. Photography is not 
painting. It's not unique. And to, to sell photographs for tens of thousands of dollars, well, we can all think differently about this, can't we? But in my way of thinking, that does a disservice. It limits the distribution. As a photographer, I can tell you that's the last thing in the world I want with my work is to limit the distribution. I would love to share my work. That's the reason I'm a photographer is so that I can share my work, my creativity, my life, my lessons, my revelations. I want to share that with as many people as I can. And I want them to be able to share with me because of the connection that I can make with them. And the minute we introduce commerce into photography, things get very complicated. And, and um, for, so for me, Hokusai and the fellow Ukiyo-e print artists became a tremendous inspiration. The nice thing about photography is there's lots of different ways to think about this. And not everybody agrees. I don't do limited prints, for example. I, I don't limit anything. I number them, but I don't do limited prints because my objective is to distribute my work as far and wide as I can. And this Hokusai was a revelation in that regard. A very talented, very internationally respected artist particularly after he, after he died and Japan was open up. Um, people around the globe love his work. How, how, as an artist, could you find that anything but satisfactory? So that, that to me was a tremendous inspiration. So I do uh, inexpensive prints um, along the lines of the Ansel Adams Special Edition collection. You can still buy them today in Yosemite Valley for, I think the last time I saw them, they were $150. They're not printed by Ansel, they're printed by Alan Ross, one of Ansel's uh, former assistants, but they're beautiful prints and they they look just exactly like an Ansel Adams original print, but they're a, a state print or whatever you wanna call them. Uh, I, I do some of those things. I do these folios that are, as I mentioned, sort of unbound books that are inexpensive, uh, under a couple hundred dollars. And I also do these little things down here in the corner called chat books. Uh, I need to explain what that is because it may not be a familiar term. Chat book, C-H-A-P, a chat book, is uh, a term that was picked up by William Morris when he decided to make handmade artist books. Um, and he picked up the term chat book from uh, basically the era of Gutenberg. Right after movable type was invented, um, movable type was used to print things like political tracts or religious sermons. What you and I might think of as a brochure, uh, they were printed in these small little folded things and they would be distributed on the street corner and the people who would distribute them were called chapmen, chapmen. And so they became called, they became uh, referred to as chat books. William Morris used that for handmade artist book and I've borrowed the term. And I make these little eight page things, printing on two sides of a piece of inkjet paper, folded, sewn, oftentimes with a little text so I could tell a little story and maybe include six or eight images. And I make them very inexpensive and I, I just, I, I love sending them out in the world. So all of that is from the inspiration of Hokusai. The sixth individual I want to talk about is Charles Dickens. And um, Charles Dickens, one of my favorite authors of all times, you probably know that his first publication early in his uh, 20s was something called Sketches by Boz. And Boz was his pen name. Just in case you don't know the story, you probably do, but just in case you don't know the story, I'll explain it, that he was hired by a newspaper in his early years to go out into the world and write little sketches. Uh, he would find a scene, like a hackney coach cab scene, and he would simply describe in maybe 1,500 words what he observed. They're not stories. They're not morality tales. They don't have a beginning, middle, and end the way a normal fictional piece of a novel or something would have, or a short story. He would just describe what he saw. And 
this collection of descriptions was assembled and published as a book after they had individually appeared in the newspaper. Uh, sketch, uh, they were published a book called Sketches by Boz. I thought this is precisely what you and I do as photographers. We take our cameras, we go out into the world, we observe, we find a scene of something that's happening and we photograph it. That, that thing might be a beautiful landscape with fantastic light. It may be street photography. It may be whatever. But a lot of what we photographers do is essentially the same thing that Charles Dickens was doing in Sketches by Boz. So I started thinking about storytelling without a plot. And how could I apply that to photography? And here's a good example. I was in China. I wanted to photograph a fishing village, told my translator, can you find one? Yes. This was in the dead of winter, by the way, in Inner Mongolia. Maybe not one of my best photographic trip decisions ever. But anyway, he, we went to this fishing village. And what I discovered was fishing villages in China are not on a river somewhere. It's what you and I might think of as a farmer's field, which they plow about two or three feet deep, fill the whole field with plastic, fill it with water, throw in a bunch of carp, <laughs> and the carp reproduce. And then when it's time to harvest, they drain the field and walk around and pick up the fish. And that's, that's uh, being a fisherman in modern China. These guys uh, saw us driving around, and I, I had jumped out of the car to make a photograph in their little village, and it was bitterly cold. And they said, come on in, come on in. So uh, the translator, you know, uh, came in with us and uh, we were chitting and chatting. And he, you can see in his hand, he's, he has a little book. And I have a little book that I carry with me to show what it is that I do. And, I, and through the translator, we were learning about fishing and what they were doing. Turns out this little place is the store. And I, um, in the, the store village, you can tell because in the in the counter behind him over his shoulder is where they keep the cigarettes and the alcohol. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, this fellow, as I'm photographing, this fellow felt like he must have wanted a portrait made. And he sat up and he looked directly in the camera and made this pose. And I thought, oh, how fortunate. And I made this picture. I would have loved to have known his story. Why did he have a glass eye? Why did he have a wooden hand? What, what caused him to lose? I wanted to know his story. But I didn't, I don't speak Mandarin. Uh, and the translator was in the other room with so, some of the other photographers. So I made this picture and that was it. But I had a travel story nonetheless of, of this encounter with these people. So I turned it into a little uh, a chat book printed on both sides of a piece of uh, inkjet paper bound with a little art paper cover. And I call these things sketches based on the inspiration from Charles Dickens. And in the text, I tell the story of finding the fishing village and photographing this guy and not knowing his story, not knowing his story was the story. And so that, that's, that's why uh, Dickens is an inspiration. Seventh, Basho and Hemingway, which don't necessarily seem like they go together, but in my mind they do for this reason. Um, I heard about something called a six-word story. If you haven't heard of this, it's a fascinating idea. And the, the, there, there is now a big website, by the way, called, I think it's called Six Word Stories. You look it up on Google, you'll, you'll find it. And it's all based on a bar bet. Hemingway was known for writing short, terse sentences. His whole novels are very short, very descriptive. And someone approached Hemingway, supposedly, this is the apocryphal story, approached Hemingway and said, I bet you cannot write a story in just six words. He, and he took the bet. He said, of course I can do that. That's easy. And he immediately said, baby shoes for sale, never worn. 
fabulous. It's a fabulous story in six words. And I, I heard about these and I thought, isn't that marvelous to have that kind of structure to the creative process, which made it immediately made me think of Basho and the limit of 17 syllables in a poem. And I, this uh, inspired me to think about constraints. Most of the time when we think about photographing projects, we, we tend to think that we can just photograph until we run out of time or until we run out of film or memory card or whatever. But the idea of constricting ourselves has implied in it the idea of intensifying the, the experience. And uh, shortly after that, I ran across this idea from Orson Welles. He said, the enemy of art is the total lack of limitations. This went completely against my preconceptions. Because in my way of thinking, the creative process is something that is loose, that is limitless, that is, you can do anything in art. But of course, if you can do anything, it means that you may be tempted to do anything. And when you do that, what you may find is they don't, they don't hold together very well. That somehow the idea of having some sort of foundation to a project might make sense. So with this in mind, I started thinking about putting constraints. What, what is the story that I want to tell and how can I constrain myself to just a few images or just one particular aspect. This is a story of my uncle Kenny. This is uncle Kenny on the left. It's actually my wife's uncle, but he lived in a farm in Kansas, was a farmer his whole life. And let me go back a slide. I was photographing uncle Kenny's farm. This is uncle Kenny playing cards when, at a family reunion. I was, I was photographing uncle Kenny's farm and Uncle Kenny came out and said, uh, I assume, I noticed, by the way, that he was dressed very nicely, nice shirt, nice pair of slacks, nice shoes. And he said, I assume that you'll probably want to be making a portrait of me about now. How, how do you not make a portrait at that time? So I made this portrait and realized that I could put together a story of Kenny in six images. So these four are of his farm and his hands and his tools and his coats. And here's Kenny. And here's Uncle Kenny and Aunt Palma's shoes in the bottom of their closet after they both passed away. And I made one of these little chapbooks out of it. The idea of telling a story like that in just six images became fascinating to me. So in, uh, what was it, 2006, no, 2016, I think it was, we launched a project at Lenswork called Seeing in Sixes. We've now done four of them, where we invited Lenswork readers to send us six image stories. And uh, all with the title, they had to have a title, optional text, maybe text, maybe not text, maybe a poem, maybe not a poem, maybe just a line, maybe just a titles. That all of that was optional, but had to be exactly six images. And that constraint became such an enlivening thing. And so we did this four years in a row where we published a book. This is the 2019 cover of the Seeing in Sixes images. So here, here's a couple of examples of this guy did a project called The Fog in the Desert, or The Fog of Desert, sorry. The Fog of Desert with these six images. Here's a photographer that did dogs and the city and six images. And the, it's just so much fun to distill and to intensify an experience by coming down to six images. So that's what I learned from Basho and from Hemingway. Photographer number eight is Wright Morris. Some of you are familiar with Wright Morris. Probably many of you are not. Wright Morris was most famous as a novelist, an award-winning novelist, but he was also a fantastic photographer. Uh, the Friends of Photography out of California did a book of his work that first introduced me to him, and I loved his work. He, he would photograph nostalgia and that kind of thing. But here's his interesting story that I found so inspiring. 
he went to his family farm in, I think it was Nebraska. He spent about a month photographing there. He was a fairly young man. But he spent a month photographing there, four by five, beautiful stuff. He, he was a master craftsman of photography, but his career was as a, no, as a novelist. He took those images and he wrote a book, this one on the left, called The Home Place. The text is fictional. The photographs are from his family farm, but he made up a story, fictional story, around some of those photographs. Brilliant. Why not combine photography and fiction. Doesn't have to be documentary. It can be something that's creatively fictional. But here's what he did that was fascinating. He took that same photographic uh, period in his life and made a second book called The Inhabitants with a completely different kind of fictional text about a different story, some of the same photographs, some of them not, as he had used in the first book, The Home Place, but a completely brand new fiction, and then did a third book called God's Country and My People, using some of the same photographs, but writing fiction. The idea of combining image and text, and in this particular case, image and fictional text, I found unbelievably inspiring, because it opens up the door to what we can do. Sure, photography is an ideal medium for documentary. Sure, it's an ideal medium for, for truth-telling. But of course, as photographers, we know that all photographs are to some degree or another a fiction. I'm reminded of that great story of the soldier visiting Picasso and saying, Picasso, I, I, I don't understand your paintings at all. Why do you paint a person with two eyes on one side of their nose? And Picasso said to the soldier, do you have a girlfriend? He said, yes, I do. He said, do you have a picture of her? He said, yes. He, he said, would you mind if I see it? And the soldier said, no. And he pulled out his wallet and brought out the, the little wallet size snapshot and handed it to Picasso. And Picasso looked at the little picture and said, is she so small? <laughs> of course, photography is a fiction. It's a two-dimensional representation of the three-dimensional world, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't have to be if you combine image and text fiction, but it can be. Do you see how this just opens up the world? We can do anything we want because we are trying to be creative. For me, it meant photography. Photographer as storyteller became a reality. This was the kind of thing that I enjoyed photographing, was machine shops and tools and <clears throat> greasy workbenches and whatnot. My grandfather was one of these people, so I'm sure it's childhood memories. But I discovered fairly early that these kind of images don't look very good <laughs> hung in a frame above the fireplace. So what could I do with them? Well, I could make folios where I combine image and text and tell little stories. This one in the middle here is uh, the title of the image is called The Metal Scrap Salvager. And the text that I used, which you can't see on the screen because it's too small, he, uh, he rolled a cigarette, spit, swore, and asked me if I wanted some tea. I would hope that people who are interested in photography would look at the photographicness of this project and, and enjoy it, and enjoy the photography and the visuals. But what I found was that kind of text made a connection with people who weren't photographers. And so the idea of image and text opened up to me, which eventually led to my book called Made of Steel. Photographer number nine is Minor White. Minor White is famous for teaching us, don't photograph what it is, photograph what else it is. Think of photography as a metaphor. I was photographing down at a tidal slough and it was this, and it was, I mean, this is not a very interesting photograph. It's green, it's sort of ugly, it's, there's not much contrast to it. And so it, I considered it a failure. But sometimes what I like to do with my photographic failures is what I call uh, PBPA, photography by pooping around. <laughs> and I just start playing with stuff in Lightroom or the dark room or whatever. And I took this image and just thought, 
I'll make this extreme contrast, as much contrast as I can build into it in several steps in Lightroom. And I created this. And suddenly I was shocked because I realized this was no longer a tidal slew. It was like looking at the night sky. It felt like I was looking at galaxies and suddenly the macro is hidden in the micro. So I, I did a whole project of this uh, called Worlds Within Worlds. And this particular image, I, I gave them all uh, fake nebula titles. <laughs> So this is called the Medusa Nebula. It was all kinds of fun. Don't photograph what it is, photograph what else it is. This felt to me like some form of worship action or something. Photograph what else it is. This felt to me like not just a picture of a seagull, but a picture of a seagull over turbulent waters, a metaphor for life, a metaphor for difficulty, etc. Photographer number 10 uh, in the uh, Those Who Inspire Me and Why is uh, Todd Walker. Again, Todd Walker is maybe not a name you're familiar with, but uh, I, I became aware of Todd Walker in uh, the late 1990s. And we published uh, an interview with Todd Walker in uh, Lenswork. And Todd Walker was a very interesting photographer because he um, he was interested in making handmade artist books that were done on a commercial press. Matter of fact, the same press that I showed you earlier in the presentation that I had in my garage, he had that same kind of press. And he would print his images in color. So he had to, because it's a one color press, he would first print cyan. Then he would put all the paper back in and print the magenta. And then he would put all the paper back in and print on top of that with the yellow and on top of that with the black. And he would make these books. And I asked him, how many books do you make? When you do a press run, how many do you make? And he said, well, I always start off with 500 sheets of paper, but the number of books I end up with is dependent on how many sheets get boogered up in the process that aren't lined up right, that get wrinkled, that have some kind of a flaw. He said, I've had some projects, I end up with like nine books that are finished and some that I might end up with two or 300, but I always start with 500 sheets of paper. I thought, isn't that interesting? He took on himself the idea of publishing his own work. And self-publication became such an interesting idea for me, particularly after I had started publishing Lens Work. Because, and this is probably not, not much of a surprise, I'm probably the one photographer in the world who cannot get published in a photography magazine because all the photography magazines kind of think of me as their competitor, I guess. And so I can't publish my own work in Lenswork. That'd be sort of tacky and self-serving. And I can't get published anywhere else in another photography magazine. So with Todd Walker as an inspiration about self-publishing, I started putting together my own publication I call Kokoro. Kokoro is Japanese for the heart mind, as in sort of the heart of the matter is the, the way they would use the term. And... I learned another lesson from Todd Walker that has been incredibly valuable because he was not dependent on someone else to publish his work. It gave him a certain momentum. He could keep working on his stuff all the time. So instead of having fits and starts and fits and starts on projects and book publication and doing work, he was constantly working. And I found that to be true. So I do this PDF. Kokoro. I put it out roughly every other month. And each issue of Kokoro will have four or five little projects in it. Here's, for example, a project called Tree Bones that appeared uh, a, a few of issues of Kokoro ago and a little text and some images and it goes together as a little project. And um, and each issue of Kokoro will have, like I say, four or five of these. And since I can publish myself and put them on my website and distribute them for free, 
it gives me a certain momentum that keeps me working that every other month I know I need to have another one of these out and I have people who look forward to them and if I'm a little late for whatever reason I start getting emails <laughs> when's the next one coming so it provides me some incentive and some motivation and I don't have to rely on anyone else to help me make those publications I would propose that every single one of you can do this that you can make your own publication, be it a, a web presentation or a PDF presentation, or now a, you could do a blurb book or something like that. You don't have to rely on what I call a gatekeeper, a publisher, a gallerist, um, somebody in authority to help you get your work out in the world that you can do it yourself. So th th those are 10. Uh, photographers who have inspired me and why the on the lens work online now I've I have recorded 37 of these little examples from various photographers and I'm about halfway through the project or so probably wrap it up sometime late next year or the following year it may or may not be a book I haven't decided yet right now it's it's audios but clearly Isaac Newton was right that if we've seen further than others it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And that's what I'm attempting to do with this project is to describe how it is that I'm, that I might be inspired and motivated from other people who have helped. And like I say, this is all available at Lenswork Online for those of you who are members. And if you're not a member of Lenswork Online, you can uh, get a essentially a 30 day trial membership. Hope you don't mind the commercial plug. <laughs> 30-day trial membership for $10. You can download three issues of Lenswork, get access to everything that's online, see if it's your cup of tea, and if it might help you in your creative process. I hope it does, but it's a, it's a way for you to find out if it's something useful. So uh, here's an example of the, the, the photographers and the other individuals who have been included in this project, and each one of them has a unique little story about how they've inspired me. And, so hopefully you'll find someone in there who can inspire you too. That is an example of those who inspire me and why. Avril, I think you need to turn your microphone on <laughs> emitter. There you, you go. Okay. I, I, I'm just so taken up with it um, that I just forgot to turn my microphone on. I, I found that totally inspirational. Honestly, I've written notes and uh, I am going to be following a lot of this. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's truly inspirational. Um, you can turn off your screen sharing now, Brooks, and I, um, I think we've got one question, but please, oh, um, could uh, everybody else now put some questions up for, for Brooks? Um, I know that I've probably got a few, but uh, I'd rather hear them from everybody else, really. We have got... Um, the first one here, which is from Peter Bozeman, and he says, um, Brooks, are there any particular types of topics or subjects that you think best suit the six image stories format? Oh, good. That's a great question, Peter. Um, we published four of those books now, and each book has 50 six image projects in it. So, uh, you know, a couple hundred and I can tell you, it's everything under the sun. It's, it's everything from landscape to still life to abstract to animals to it. I, I, think, uh, I think if there's a, a genre of photography that exists, there's probably an example in one of those four books. So I, I, I'm not sure there are any limitations um, in terms of subject matter or what it is that you want to say. And that's one of the things I love about that project. Right. I, I actually um, heard you talk about it before and I, I think it's great. And it's one of the things that I certainly want to start doing as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question here from uh, Glynis Harrison and she says, do you ever shoot in color? You know, I didn't in my, uh, wet darkroom days. I was a black and white photographer from the beginning, primarily because color was so complex and the chemistry was so 
uh, you know, it was kind of risky and whatnot. So I didn't do color, but then I, I bought a digital camera in 2000, whatever it was, three. And of course the digital camera captures in color. And I had the experience that I think many, many people do, which is you load up the digital image, you convert it to black and white because you're a black and white photographer. And then you say, which I did many times, hey, you know what? I think I like that better in color. <laughs> <laughs> so I started working in color in the early uh, 2000s. And, you know, now I think of color as another compositional thing. If the project is enhanced and more communicative and more expressive and more emotive in color, I don't hesitate to use it. But I, I don't default to color. I sort of default to black and white and then use color if it's required. Yeah. But, you prefer black and white because that's where you came from. Is that right? You know, I, I think I prefer whatever the project needs. And if the project needs, you know, if the project needs to be panorama, I use panorama. If the project needs to be color, I use color. If the project needs to have rounded corners, I use rounded corners. I, I think when it comes to making art, there are no rules. There's whatever works best. And th that I think is the measure of an artist is do they have the sensitivity to figure out what works best rather than following some formulaic approach? Yeah. So it's just like following your inner self, like you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. I've got a question from John Miskelly. He says, are you continuing to do the seeing in sixes? And I'm wondering if he's talking about the actual, there's a competition, isn't there that you do? Yeah. Yeah. We did it four years in a row and we kind of felt like we needed to do something else and we had another idea. So this year we've, uh, we're just in the process of printing an, a book called Our Magnificent Planet, which is not six inch image projects. It's sort of back to the idea of one stunning image from each photographer. So there's 300 photographers and 300 photographs in that book. Next year in 2021, we haven't decided. We, we might we might do another project that's individual images. We might go back to do seeing in sixes, but we try to do one lens work community book project a year. Yeah. And we, we just haven't decided what next year is going to be. So it may be seeing in sixes. Okay. Stay tuned. Yeah. So I guess if people sign up for the free trial, they might be able to get a clean, a bit more information through that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And it'll be on our website too, on okay. lenswork.com. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Um, then I've got a question here from Kevin James, which simply says film or digital? Oh, uh, both in my life. I mean, I, I spent the first 30 or 40 years of my photography doing exclusively film because that's all there was. When digital came about, I, for about a decade, I was using both. Um, but I, I'm now digital only, but for a, a different sort of reason. What I discovered was that I just wasn't very good in the dark room and I really struggled for me to make a, 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 an acceptable print. One that I could be proud of would take me all weekend. And that process to a large degree was saying, well, I, you know, I need to darken this corner, but how much? And I'd darken it too much, or I'd darken it not enough. And then I'd have to do it again. And so it was fighting, fighting, fighting recalcitrant chemicals. Mm. Uh, because I just wasn't, I, I didn't have a native talent. So probably 90% of my time was mechanics. And 10% of my time was creativity. With the digital darkroom, because it's so instantaneous, and because it's, much more predictable. And now particularly I use Lightroom for most of my work so that it's non-destructive editing. I spend 90% of my time thinking about aesthetics and expression and how it's working or not working and 10% of my time on the mechanics. So for me, the digital darkroom has been a liberation to spend more time with my creative muse and less time with my mechanical muse. Yeah. But that's just me. That really makes sense, actually. 
it really does make sense. I, I, I've never done the dark room stuff, but you know, to me, it would be, you know, scary. <laughs> well, it's, it's all kinds of fun. I mean, I enjoyed the, there are certain aspects of going into a dark room and developing film in the total dead black with, you know, some good music in the background. That's, that's very fun, mm -hmm. but, it, uh, but I'm much more productive in the digital world. Okay, that's good. Thank you. I've got a question from um, John Humphrey. Why do you number your prints? Well, I think as artists, we do have some responsibility to provide a provenance for what we do. And so um, once we make something, <clears throat> I, I think it does help somebody somewhere someday to know how many of those were made. The problem with numbering, of course, is it doesn't tell you anything about the total number that was made. It just tells you where it is in the sequence. So with the idea of provenance in mind, what I do now is, in the first place, I don't produce inventory. I gave up doing that years ago. In my wet darkroom days, I would make prints and mat them and store them in a light impressions box in the closet and they amassed in there. And the idea being that if anybody ever wanted to buy something, then I had inventory to pick from. I don't do that anymore. Now I create one master uh, inkjet prints and then uh, I make it available. And if anybody wants to buy one or if I wanna give one away or whatever the case may be, I produce just for distribution. So if John wanted to buy one of my chapbooks or folios or whatever, not only would it be numbered so he knows where his copy is in the sequence of things, but I also write the purchaser's name on them in what's called the colophon so that, it, it, so that there's a connection between me and the person who was the impetus to, to make the, the chat book or the folio and whatnot. And, and there's a direct line of provenance between me and them. At some point in time, I will, well, Ansel used to say he would go into the final wash. And uh, I've updated that and say, uh, at some point in time, I'll end up in the ink maintenance tank. Uh, oh. <laughs> and at that point, I won't care about the provenance, but somebody someday might. So yeah. why not make it well, a little easier for them? Let's hope that's in the very distant future. Um, I but yeah, I think it makes it really personal actually when you do that for somebody. And it, like you say, it does give you that link and it's, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, I've got a question here from Ian McIntosh. Do you produce audio visual presentations? I do some. Um, yeah, and on my personal website, which is brooksjensenarts.com, you'll find some videos. I've done uh, maybe a dozen of them or something like that. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun, but there's an aspect of video that I'm less comfortable with than I wish I was, maybe because of my age and the generation I grew up in. But the, the problem with video is that the viewer is not in control of the time the producer is and as a viewer as a photographer sometimes I want to linger on an image and I want to spend some time with it and I want to think about it and I want to think about how it compares to other images that I carry around in my mental gallery and in a video presentation I lose control of that. And so I think my heart is with still photography rather than with video. Mm -hmm. But sometimes with voiceover, it's kind of fun. So I've, I've done some. Yeah, okay, that's a good answer. I do like your podcast, by the way. If anybody, okay. if anybody um, hasn't heard um, Brooks's podcast, I can highly recommend them. Um, all right, I've got a question here from Stuart Wall says, hi, Brooke, you seem very engaged with oriental ways of approaching life. Mm -hmm. is this, if this is the case, does it help you with image making and in what way? Well, it does because when you go to a place like Japan or China, it's like it's all photographable because it's all new and different and whatnot. Um, probably the biggest thing I've uh, ad adopted from uh, oriental ways of thinking is a certain love of minimalism. 
a, a lot of Japanese and Chinese arts are very minimalistic. And uh, I, I love the work, for example, of Michael Kenna, if you know him, he's a fairly well-known photographer from uh, the Seattle area. And he's a minimalist photographer. And that, that always speaks to my heart somehow. And I'm sure that has something to do with uh, my interest in the Orient, but uh, who, who knows where these inspirations come from? Maybe I just have an, uh, you know, an Oriental muse in my brain somehow. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a question here from Martin Heathcote. It says, do you ever just shoot a single image or do you tend to shoot purely in project mode? I think he's talking well, about you know, I... your, yeah. Yeah, as I mentioned with uh, Jerry Yulesman and the idea of gathering assets, I, I, I never shoot in project. Well, I shouldn't say never. O occasionally, I'll shoot in project mode, but, but a lot of times, I'm just photographing because I'm reacting. For me, a project is, it's possible that it be of some place. I, I go somewhere and it's really interesting and it's really photogenic and I'll make a whole bunch of pictures there and that becomes a self-contained project. More often than not, however, I will find that there's a bunch of images that go together as a project that I discover in my Lightroom catalog. Sometimes with a simple project like keywording. I, I didn't know until I had done a lot of keywording in Lightroom, for example, that I had 800 pictures of chairs. Wow. I didn't even know I was interested in chairs. <laughs> and they're from all over the world. So somehow a chair must be a big deal to me. And so I've made some projects now with chairs. But they're, they're not, they weren't photographed to be a project. They were discovered to be a project later. And wow. that's that's most often what happens with me. So when I'm photographing, I'm just photographing individual images, gathering right. assets. Yeah. And then the project coalesces when I'm spending time looking at my Lightroom catalog or just thinking yeah. about what I have. Sorting your images out into piles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, love that. Right. I'm going to do, I'm definitely doing that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's a question from Diane Seddon. Um, do you think that some photographers are restricted by the rules that other people are setting? Oh, of course. And I think we absolutely have to resist it. I mean, um, nothing worse in art making than inflexible rules. On the other hand, if you swing that too far in the other direction and you have limitless possibilities, as Orson Welles said, that's a, a real detriment, you know, that the, the lack of limitations can be a problem. So, for, for example, if you go out in the world with your camera and you can photograph anything in the world that you see out there with your camera, it's easy to get nonplussed and say, I, I, I don't have any idea what to photograph. If you go out in the world and say, okay, today I'm going to go out in the world and photograph fences. I see, Avril, you've got a fence behind you in the image. Yes. If you say, I'm going to go photograph fences, you'll probably find lots of fences to photograph. And so your creativity is inspired. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're out there photographing fences and all of a sudden you see, you know, a beautiful tree, it would be a shame to say, well, I'm not going to photograph the tree because today I'm doing fences. You know, mm -hmm. you have to you have to realize that that uh, whatever works for you is what works. And probably it's some combination of following rules and abandoning rules that's where it's going to be most productive. Okay. We've got a lot of questions, just to warn you, so I'm going to try and get okay. a bit quicker. Hey, um, I've got a giant <laughs> cup of coffee, so I'm okay. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a question from Hadley Johnson. He says, Brooks, you are a proponent of content, content, content in photography. Yes. Could you discuss the importance of this concept? Well, yeah, I can. And I think, um, I think what it boils down to is this. I, I operate under the assumption that everyone who has ever been alive has the potential for being a creative individual. I, I just, I believe that. And so every one of us has something that we can say and that we might want to say. And some of us, 
like this group, we pick up a camera and we try to say something interesting with our camera. What counts is what we say, not what camera we use, not what galleries we're represented in, not how many prints we sell. I think when it's all said and done, what counts is what do you have to say? That's what I mean by content, content, content. And I believe that the real challenge of being an artist is trying to figure out what it is we want to say. And here's a short little story. I once knew a fellow who had uh, spent a tremendous amount of time developing his photographic craft. He was, uh, he'd gone to workshops like crazy. He, he had built the most gorgeous darkroom. He had mastered the eight by 10 contact print, was probably the best printer I ever knew. And one day he just quit photography and walked away, tore down his darkroom and took up golf. And he was a very good friend of mine. Years later, I, I bumped into him and I said, you know, what happened? Why did you give up photography? You were so good at it. You were such a talent. And he said, well, I gave up photography because after I figured out that I could make a print pretty much at will, he said, I figured out I had nothing to say. It was sad. I, I was saddened by it. And I also don't believe him. I believe he did have something to say, but he... He had somehow gotten so hooked into the idea of mastering technique and equipment and all of that, that he hadn't developed himself as a sensitive individual. Morley Bear, a great photographer from California, once said, if you want to be a great artist, first you have to be a great person. And by that, he didn't mean famous or moral or whatever. He meant you had to develop yourself as a person. That's what content, content, content is about. Reading. Mm -hmm looking, listening, talking, absorbing, thinking. Th those are the things of art. Then you combine that with craft and you can move people. Yeah, it's a big subject that is, isn't it? And it's a, it is. one that I think deserves a lot of thinking about. And I think you've, you've sort of promoted that today, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I've got a question from Anne Sutcliffe. Um, so when you make your books and folios, how important do you consider panelling images so they fit together? Or do you just include images that tell the story you want to tell? I think, we, I think we're sort of coming to the end now as well. So maybe we might have to make that the last one. I'm not sure. Let's okay. check. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, when you start working in groups of images, one of the interesting things that happens is that the, the group takes priority over the individual image because what the group says together sort of sometimes in between the lines if you will or in between the pictures becomes the real important part of the group and so oftentimes i find myself having to discard an image that i really love it's a fantastic image and i really like it but it doesn't contribute to the group like it needs to so I'll take that out and put something else in because it fits the group or because it fits the sequence. Or if I'm doing one of these handmade artist books, it fits the needs of the facing pages of the handmade artist book. But that's okay. I'll take that really great image and maybe use it on another project down the road somewhere. But, but yeah, group thinking is quite a bit different from the individual image thinking. And I think that's one of the things that's very exciting for people who have focused so much on making the individual stunning image to put on the wall above the fireplace. When you start thinking in terms of groups, you find you have lots of images that are terrific in a group that maybe wouldn't have made it above the fireplace. And you find there's a different sort of creative process involved that can be very invigorating. Mm -hmm. Great. Brooks, are you okay to continue for a bit longer? Because we have got some really interesting questions, but I'm really conscious of the time. Are you okay to answer a few more? Well, it's 9.25 in the morning, my time. I'm just getting going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, yeah, I'm, I heard that you're over in, in Washington, yeah? Is yes, that right? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, left okay. coast. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so here's a question from John Tissandier. I hope I've said his name right. I love the way your photography has been inspired so inspired by so many non-photographic sources, but what about music? 
Yeah, music is an inspiration to me in this regard. And I, I'm not so sure I could say that it changes my visuals because they're just too different. But here's the one thing I do love about music. Music doesn't point to anything else. It's the end. It, it, it is what it is. And that's what abstract photography is. Some people think of abstract photography as sort of a Rorschach test. You know, it looks like a bird. And so it's an abstract, but it's an abstract bird. Uh, music is an inspiration to me in the sense that it doesn't point to anything. And so I use that as an inspiration for my abstract photography. That sometimes I like the idea that it's just its own thing and you're not supposed to project onto it anything. Um, I often find that when I listen to music, I'll get inspired, but not in the sense that that combination of chord makes me want to make a combination of tones. My, my brain just doesn't connect that way. But boy, uh, if, you can, if you can listen to a Rachmaninoff piano concerto and not want to go make art, <laughs> yeah. I can't relate. Yeah. Thank you. Um, here's um, a question from Alec Davies. He says, where do you see photography in the future? Crystal ball, please. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, to be honest, I have some concern about that. Because the minute you start talking about photography in the future, in my way of thinking anyway, we, we need to talk about the younger generation, not the future of technology, although that could be a topic too. The younger generation, I think, is um, there's, a, there's, there's a, a different sort of thing happening in the younger generation that does give me some concern. And that is their approach to photography is completely outside of what I might call photographic history. Um, they're using cameras in creative and innovative ways. There's no question about that. But whether or not they appreciate uh, what's happened before them in photography, I'm not sure. I once did a review at a, at a photo review event where this, this young woman who was an MFA graduate sat down at my table and showed me her work. And I looked at it, it was beautifully done. And I said, this work reminds me a lot of the work of Edward Weston. And I intended that to be a compliment. And she said, who's Edward Weston? I've never heard of him. And she was an MFA graduate. How, how do you become an MFA graduate and not know of Edward Weston? That, uh, to me, that was a shock. And she mm -hmm. said, well, I didn't have to take the history of photography. It wasn't required in my class, so I didn't. Right. And I'm worried about that. I, I think if we see further than others, it's because we stand on the shoulders of giants. Doesn't mean we have to do what they did, but I think we don't have to repeat their mistakes um, in order to, to validate ourselves, that we, we should understand something about the history, not just of photography, but the history of painting and the history of visual mm -hmm. arts and the history of poetry and the history of culture. I think all of that leads into, and I'm hoping the next generation comes alive to that. I know when I was in my 20s, I wasn't alive to it. And, uh, and I wish I had been. So m maybe it's going to be just fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, I've got a question from Timothy Floyd. He said, he says, what inspires you, Brooks, to go out and photograph? Do you go regularly or do you wait for inspiration? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I go regularly and I'm almost never inspired to go because life is busy. We're all busy. We have families, we have jobs, we have obligations, we have lawns that need to be mowed and clothes that need to be washed. It's hard to find inspiration in all of that to make art, although I suppose it's possible. So what happens with me is when I go out photographing, there, there's a transition time that has to take place. And if I'm not lucky, that transition time might take a couple of days before I sort of 
let go of daily life and start seeing photographically again. If I'm really lucky, I can do it in an hour. But I have to go through that transition and put myself in a state of mind. Mm -hmm. And I've tried exercises and people have ideas about how to flip your brain so that you can, but, but my, I just have never been successful with it. So what I have to do is just go and then allow it to unfold. Mm -hmm. And then, by the way, the same thing happens when I come back. You know, I'll, I'll come back from a, you know, a week of photographing or a weekend of photographing or whatever it is. And when I get back, you know, it takes me a while to realize that I, I, I really should wash some clothes. <laughs> I just want to go under light. You're still in photo mode. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Exactly. Great. That's a good answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a, a question from Malcolm Barmer. Do you have a fear that great digital images produced today will be lost forever if they are never printed? Oh, this would be interesting because I think I know what you're going to say. Yeah, exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. If you talk to any archivist who's worth their salt, they will tell you the most risky position of all is to have one copy of something. If there is one copy, the chances of it getting lost to history is huge. The safest way to protect the future of something like a piece of artwork is to have multiple copies of it. Well, that's hard to do in the world of painting or the world of sculpture or whatever the case may be. It's much easier to do in the world of photography because we can so easily make copies. So when I put out a, an issue of Kokoro, for example, my downloadable PDF, uh, tens of thousands of them go out into the world and people have them on their computers. Well, the, the chances of that surviving now is much, much greater simply because the number of copies. Yeah. The second part of that answer is, let's, let's think about uh, Billie Holiday who, you know, she was, she was a fabulous singer, and, but her career was at the beginning of recorded audio. Her initial music was done on cylinders and 78 records and all that kind of stuff. But you and I can still listen to her today mm -hmm. because her art was worthy that it got transferred into media as it progressed from 78s to... 33 LPs to eight track tapes to cassette tapes to MP3s to downloadable files. And we can still listen to Billie Holiday today because her content was so magnificent. Same thing with photography. Even though we may publish a PDF or a JPEG or whatever that might disappear with the advance of technology in the future, if the content is worthy, it will survive because it'll get translated somehow into whatever the new medium is. So copies and content, content, content. To, to me, those are the answers. Brilliant. Okay, uh, I've got a question here from Hugh Griffiths. Is pre-visualization wrong? Uh, your comments on Jerry Ulsman, or are there times when it is right and times when it is wrong? Well, I think for the analog photographer, it's uh, the pre-visualization aspects of knowing how to expose and develop are not only right, they're, they're almost mandatory because film is not very forgiving. And if you don't have the correct exposure and you don't have the correct development, getting the right tones in an analog print is very, very difficult. So it depends on what medium you're using. With digital photography, um, the, the technology is much more forgiving in terms of trying to get the right tones. You know, everybody wants to expose to the right, and I suppose there's some virtues in that. What I think is maybe more important in my way of thinking is composition and what you're doing in terms of what goes in the frame and where you position things in the frame, because that's something you can't change, whether it's analog or digital. Well, I suppose you can move things in Photoshop or whatever, but um, but pre-visualization, I think, is a tool that has to be used when it's necessary, and uh, and that's definitely a, a a more 
demanding and more important tool in analog than digital. Right, okay. Here's a question from um, Tove Abrams. He says, have you digitized form slides and or negatives and played with them? Yes, I have. Uh, I've, I've scanned negatives uh, because I, I have probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 negatives from my analog days. And a few of those <laughs> are worthy of digitizing. I haven't done the whole archive because that was when I was younger. And, you know, now that I look back on them, I find myself more often than not saying, what was I thinking? But but if I need to digitize a negative, I can I, I do so, and I either scan them, and uh, use Silverfast or something like that, and an Epson scanner. Or more recently, I picked up the idea of uh, using my uh, digital camera to photograph a negative with backlit illumination, and you okay. can end up with a pretty doggone good digital image that way, unless you're trying to make a huge print. Um, but uh, but for doing PDFs or web presentations or eight by tens, eleven by fourteens, uh, that's a perfectly good method that doesn't require a scanner and all the fuss of scanning. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, okay, here's a question from Colin Harrison. If you compare, say, one of your old wet mono images to your modern day digital mono conversion, would there be much difference? Um, well, certainly the digital media allows me to do things that I, that I couldn't do in an analog environment. I, I can do more detailed manipulations. Uh, I can, you know, if there's a twig sticking in the side of the frame, it's a little easier to take out. Um, with analog, it was, uh, I could do it, but it was much more complex and airbrushing and all that kind of stuff. So do I end up with better photographs? Um, I think maybe so. Um, the one thing I never did in the analog darkroom, but I know a number of photographers who did do it, was um, unsharp masking. And unsharp masking had that ability to increase local contrast and detail in ways that, that really made an analog image come alive. Well, I never did that because it's a very nitpicky sort of detailed thing. But you can do essentially the equivalent of that with the clarity control, for example, in Lightroom yeah. or similar controls in Photoshop or a phase, uh, what's, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, th there's ways to accomplish that. And that makes a big difference in terms of the readability of images sometimes. So. You know, as much as I, I have aspects of the wet darkroom I miss, there are more aspects of the digital darkroom that I'm glad to take advantage of. Okay, cool. Um, here's an interesting question from Nigel Shergold. Do you see in black and white? No, I'm not very good at that. As a matter of fact, uh, it took me a long time to figure this out but I don't see very well at all in two dimensions. And uh, so for me, the ground glass of a view camera was an incredibly important thing. When I let go of, in my youth, let go of 35 millimeter and twin lens reflex and started using view cameras, it made a huge improvement. And then uh, eventually I made a, a Polaroid adapter for my view camera so that I could shoot uh, Polaroid positive negative film in the field and uh, made a huge leap forward because now I could see in two-dimensional black and white what I was composing and it changed my work in the field dramatically. Well even now 40, 40 years later I, I still don't see very well in either two dimensions or black and white. So for me the LCD on the back of my digital camera is incredibly important. I have my camera set up so that I see in black and white. It shows a black and yeah. white image and it's two dimensional. And if I'm going to compose in color, I'll probably know that in the field and I can quickly turn the color on the LCD monitor. But either way, I can see two dimensionally. So for me, it's the best time ever in the history of photography because of my limitations. Right. Okay. 
good. Um, okay, I'm, I'm sorry in advance, um, Andrew, because I'm going to pronounce your name incorrectly. I think it's Lachinsky, Andrew Lachinsky. Where asks Brooks, where do you see fine art photography grow, going in 10 to 20 years? Boy. Um, there are so many aspects of fine art photography that I, I think you'd have to, you'd have to think more carefully about which venue. If we're talking about books, that would lead me down one path. And all you have to do is look at what's happening in the world of publishing and books and bookstores and the environmental impact of paper and all that. And you, you can see where that might lead you in one direction. In, when you go in terms of galleries and collectability and fine art photography as a collectible artifact and commodity, that might lead you in another direction. To me, I, I think the more interesting aspect is not how the rest of the world is going to look at photography, but how we photographers are likely to change in terms of our aesthetic. And the one thing that I'm hoping for is that photography becomes less and less about being junior painting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I love the pretty picture. We all love the beautiful, you know, um, image, whether it's a landscape or a portrait or whatever. We all love that, and that's a great thing. But a lot of that is following the aesthetic of painting. And mm -hmm. I think with all the changes that are happening now with not only media, but distribution and all of that. I think photography is in the process of, of developing its own aesthetic. And we can see that in young photographers and new photographers uh, in ways that I think are going to be quite interesting. I, mm. I, I would love to come back, you know, about 50 years from now and see <laughs> where things yeah, are. It's that but I don't think it'll be the same aesthetic that we have today. Yeah, it's that crystal ball again, isn't it? That's what we need. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are you still okay to answer a few more? Sure. Brooks, yeah, okay? Okay. Um, so I've got uh, a question here from Mick Warmington. He says, hi, Brooks. Once again, why do you think some photographers, I think he means, a, a, it says a duo. I don't know this word. Is that a word? Um, the term artist and others not. Yeah, that's, uh, from what I understand, is a little bit of a cultural thing. Um, some of my British friends tell me, I'm not sure if this is true, but it's what they tell me, that a, uh, a, a British person would never refer to themselves as an artist because it's a little crass and braggadocious. Where here, I think it's important to think of ourselves that way. Um, there's an old story, one of my favorite stories of a publisher sending <clears throat> Edward Weston a, a big envelope full of proofs for a book or something that was happening. And the envelope was addressed, Edward Weston, comma, artist. And supposedly, the way the apocryphal story goes, is Edward Weston looked at all the proofs and went to send it back, and he crossed off the word artist and put <laughs> photographer. Oh, wow. Above it in handwriting, as though he was making some kind of positive statement about photography. Mm -hmm. It's a fun apocryphal story, but quite honestly, I think he, he got it exactly backwards. I, I think photography, photography is such a flexible and plastic medium that it can be used to do so many things. You can do passport photos with it. You can do documentary with it. You can do product photography with it. Being an artist is one thing you can do with a photographer. And so mm -hmm. when I'm, for example, introduced at a party or something by a mutual friend, if they say, oh, here's Brooks Jensen, he's a photographer, the first question I always get is, oh, do you do weddings? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't. And so I've encouraged my friends to introduce me as an artist because it's, it's more descriptive of what it is that a lot of us try to do rather than photographer, which says something about cameras and media rather than content and intent. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. I totally I hope, agree I hope that answers there. Mick's question. Oh, I, 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 to I totally agree with you there. So there you go. Um, okay, a question from Jennifer Barnaby. Now that almost everyone has a camera available, do you think this is to the detriment uh, to the quality of imagery or contributing to it? Well, you know, if we look back in history, uh, when in the in the 1970s, when Canon introduced uh, the Canon AE-1, some of you are smiling now because you remember what that camera was, that had auto exposure and all that stuff. Um, when they introduced the Canon AE-1, 35 millimeter camera sales took off like they had never been before. And there was a huge number of new people introduced to photography. It was a giant bubble a small percentage of those got hooked by photography and suddenly they said, wow, this is cool. I, I, you know, I need to get a view camera. I need to go to a Ansel Adams workshop. I need to, you know, discover what it means to be a photographic artist. And they pursued that with passion. And some of those people are still doing it today. Mm -hmm. I think exactly the same thing is happening now. All those iPhones and Android phones and, all those cameras that are being sold, that huge bubble. Now, trillions of photographs being made. What's going to happen is a very tiny percentage of those people are going to get hooked. And they're going to say, this is fantastic. This is a way to express myself. And they're going to become uh, par part of the group, like all of us, who are trying to pursue the path of personal expressive photography. And that'll be good, but it'll never be, you know, a significant percentage of all those people who are now have iPhones and cameras. It'll always be small, but there'll be a big number of them. And I, I think five or 10 years from now, we're going to find that there will be more photographic artists than ever before in history because of the giant bubble that we're experiencing mm -hmm. right now. Great. Um, a question from Adrian Connolly. Um, simple question. Do you title your images? Um, generally not, although I've, uh, if it's important, I do so. I mentioned the project Worlds Within Worlds, where I made the stuff that looked like the galaxy and the nebula. I titled all those because it was fun. And so I made up fake nebula names. And uh, so for that project, it made sense. For most other projects, I titled the project, but not the individual images. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I know a lot of people do, and I don't have any problem with that, with one exception, and that is the ubiquitous title, Untitled, which is, of course, a title. Yes. That seems rather silly to me. But. Yeah. Is that, do you not title them because you do the six word, um, you know, uh, stories alongside a lot of them and you do a lot of, um, you know, um, writing alongside your pictures? Well, in general, here's the principle that, that I tend to think about when I uh, use titles or text or paragraphs or whatever. And it, it's this, imagine that someone you want to see your work is going through their life. They, they don't, they're not giving you and your artwork a, a, a thought. You, you're just not on their radar whatsoever. But somehow they bump into your work and you need to sort of invite them, seduce them, convince them to interrupt their life and look at your photographs or, or your artwork somehow. What a title and sometimes the introductory text does is it helps create the bridge so that it makes the transition from going through their daily life to interrupting their daily life and looking at your images. It helps make that transition a little easier. So I think of it as a bridge. Yeah. And what a title does is it prepares someone to, to, uh, to understand a little more about what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. It can't explain it. it it's, not, it's not supposed to describe what they see. It's supposed to make it easier for them to make the transition. So that's how I think of titles and text. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Carolina 
Zumaran Jones mm. in in a series project in a series or project do all individual images have to be the best of its kind um, do projects include transition images yeah those are two two separate questions yeah I, I, think, I think so yeah I think the idea for me is that the project is more important than the images so um, if you have, let's just call it a B image, that's maybe not a greatest hits image, but it really contributes something to the project. I wouldn't hesitate using it at all. It doesn't have to be the best of your images. If it's the right image at the right place in the sequence that accomplishes what you want. As a matter of fact, one of the things I love about working in projects rather than wall art is that with projects, it breathes life into lots of images that wouldn't make it as wall art. Because wall art, they sort of need to be the smack you upside the head and wow images. Mm. Projects, matter of fact, it, it sort of doesn't work if they're all those kinds of images because you can only get whacked upside the head so many times. <laughs> so yeah. it's better if so they the project, are the kinds of, yeah. Yeah, it's better if the project has a certain rhythm to it, you know, it's like, it's like a movie can't be all car crashes. You've mm. got to have some space in between the car crashes or else it just gets to be too much. Okay. And the same yeah. thing with, with a project of 10 images, if all 10 images are double a fantastic super images, it's too much. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, Brian Itton asks, do you prefer to capture your image in camera? or in post-production? That's a bit confusing. Does he mean, no, I, I, yeah, I think you know. I understand what he's talking about. Um, with, with the world of digital photography, I shoot exclusively in RAW so that, uh, so that I, I'm not burdened with deciding what the final implementation of an image is in camera. And, and that feeds the idea of the gathering assets from Jerry Yulesman in this mm -hmm. way that if I'm looking at an image and trying to say, what's the best way to render this image? It's probably going to be because it fits some preconceived idea of what that image is supposed to look like. Another word for that is it's, it's more closely aligned with the cliche. On the other hand, if we think of an image as a raw asset that we can use in any way we want, depending on how we want to process it for a particular project, then it means there isn't one right way to process an image. There may be several right ways to process the image, depending on how it's being used in the project. That leads me to the, to the discussion of style. When I was a young photographer, everybody was in pursuit of some style. They wanted to have a style that identified them and their career. The theory mm. being, I guess, that when you, when someone looked at that image, they say, oh, that's, I recognize that style. That's a Brooks Jensen image or whatever. I think that's an archaic way of thinking. I think now every project has a style. Right. And some projects are going to be dark and moody and some are going to be light and pastel. And sometimes they're going to have borders of one kind or another. Every project has its own style. And that style is whatever's best used to say what it is you're trying to say emotionally mm -hmm. and visually. And so I have many, many images that are used in more than one project. Uh, and in each project, they're processed differently. Well, that doesn't make sense if you're trying to do processing in camera. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. And that's that, you know, everything you say opens up another sort of thought process in my head. It's really interesting. <laughs> um, okay. Here's a question from Pauline. Uh, sorry, Pauline, if I get this wrong. Chiarelli. Um, how have the artists you have featured in lens work influenced your craft as a photographer? Oh, gosh. Well, the first thing I, I have to tell you is it gives me uh, great joy to see how many creative people there are in the world. Um, you know, every time we do a submissions review, it sort of breaks our heart because we only have so many 
images. There's so many pages in the magazine and we can only use a limited number of portfolios. And there's so much good work being done out there that I, I find that incredibly inspiring. There are occasions when I see what someone has done from a stylistic or a craft point of view that I think, wow, that's fantastic. I need to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, you have to make sure that you're not just copying what they're doing, that it has to be appropriate. But, uh, but the thing I, I love about photography is it is such a bendable, twistable, flexible plastic material that, you know, people are doing just the most amazing things with it. And I, I just love it. So I find that very inspiring. And I'm sure a lot of that has worked its way one way or another into, into my work. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not conscious of it, but that doesn't mean the influence isn't there. Yeah, that's great. Okay, and here's a question from John Humphrey. Um, have you created projects from your negatives and published them? Oh, well, yeah, most of the images in, the, in my book, Made of Steel, were mm -hmm. from negatives. Uh, there are a few later ones that were digital images, but almost all of that book was, was done with, <clears throat> excuse me, from film. And um, to go along with the book publication, there is a set of five folios of that same work, the made of steel work, the garages and the machine shops and the text that goes with it. So there's a there's a group of images from Oregon, a group of images from Washington, a group of images from Texas, a group of images from the central states. And again, almost all of that is from scanned uh, negatives. Matter of fact, most of those are from two and a quarter, three and a quarter negatives. Wow, that's great, thank you. Um, Chris Harvey asks, do you have a photographic era you would have liked to have worked in? Now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've said for years, this is the best time in the history of photography to be a photographer. I mean, think of the possibilities we have. If you want to do gum by chromates, you can do it. You don't have to wait for it to be invented. You can buy the materials and do it. If you want to do platinum palladium prints, if you want to do 11 by 14 contact sheets uh, or contact prints from uh, gelatin silver, you can. Now is the best time ever to be a photographer. I'm amazed when I look back in history at the work that was done by the previous generations with the incredible limitations they have. But I, I don't think I'd want to go back there. I mean, I, I think now is fantastic. And, and uh, we're so lucky that we have all of this history to, to learn from. And not only that, all of the photographers throughout history have been so generous. There are no secrets. Everybody, you know, publishes their formulas and what they do. And how, how lucky are we that we have all that to rely on? Yeah, that's good. We've just got a couple more questions. We're nearly okay. there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, there's a question here from Roger Moore. Do you have a view on competition photography? Photography as sport rather than art? I think that sounds like a bit like two questions or maybe it means no. the same thing. Mm. I'm, I'm not a big fan of blue ribbons and red ribbons and all of that uh, and competition for the simple reason that um, w whenever there's a competition, think of sports, you know, uh, uh, you have to have rules and the rules define how the game is played. And if you violate those rules, you get a penalty or you get kicked out of the game or whatever the case may be. Well, the same thing happens in photography. The minute there's a competition, there's going to be rules. And the minute there are rules, what we've done is put uh, limitations on creativity and we've elevated the cliche. So, you know, if you're going to do that ubiquitous picture of the dewy spider web or the, the dewy rose. You have to have exactly the right amount of dew with exactly the right amount of rose and all that kind of stuff. And I, I think it tends to push people into more and more formulaic work. The other side of that coin, of course, is that I think it's good to get feedback. I, I, I don't think it's the best strategy to be an artist working in isolation. 
But rather than competitions, I'm more an advocate of workshops and environments like that, where instead of being judged as thumbs up or thumbs down, which is what social media does, and I'm not an advocate of that either, I like the 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 camaraderie and the helpfulness that happens in a workshop where everybody's trying to help everybody else become a better photographer. That to me is a is more conducive to artistic growth rather than artistic limitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thank you. Two more. Okay, so here's a que another question from John Humphrey. How does iPhone photography fit into the art of photography? If you know the image was shot on an iPhone, do you have a unique response? You know, I, 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 can, I'm, I could care less, quite honestly. I am absolutely equipment agnostic. So much so that when we do portfolio reviews for what we publish in Lenswork, we never look at what camera they use, etc. And years and years and years ago, we published a wonderful body of work. And I was interviewing the photographer. And he happened to mention that the whole thing was done on an iPhone. I didn't even know. I mean, it was I could care less. If uh, and, and I, I don't think that's important any more than knowing what brushes or what kind of canvas uh, Rembrandt used. You know, the, the, the imagery moves you and touches your heart or it doesn't. And what equipment or what lens or what brand or what process or what technique was used is only important to photographers who are studying process. That's important. But to other people, to viewers, I, I don't think it, it makes any difference at all. And I would much rather have a person with an artistic sensitivity and a creative eye using an iPhone than a technological expert with an eight by 10 view camera who doesn't know a picture from, you know, anything else, so. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, the last question now okay. is from Ian Lockery. And this is interesting because this probably should have been the first one. When and where did you start photography and were your parents inspirational in that? Yeah, my parents weren't. Um, what happened in my case is that uh, in my youth, I'm talking about, you know, 10, 15 years old. For some reason, I got absolutely fascinated with protozoas, amoebas and paramecium and all that stuff that you could see through the microscope. So when I got into high school, uh, I was in a special science class and I had to do a report on a particular kind of protozoa which involved photographing it through the microscope. And I knew nothing about photography, so I signed up for the photography class. Wow. And the photography class required that we do a book report. So I went down to the library to find a book by a photographer to write a book report on. And the book I happened to pick up was by Wynne Bullock. And I looked at Wynne Bullock's photographs, and that was the end of my interest in protozoology. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was Wynne Bullock who really opened my eyes to the idea of photography as an expressive art form. And I've been engaged in photography ever since. Thank goodness for Wynne Bullock. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just fantastic. I eventually had the, had the opportunity to meet his widow and daughter. And we, at Lenswork, we ended up doing the Wynne Bullock estate prints. So there I was in our wet dark room making estate prints of Child in Forest and all those great Wynne Bullock prints. And I tell you, that was a cosmic experience. How amazing. Yeah. And you know, it's, isn't it just amazing that you picked up that particular book? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, that this was has been last... so much fun. Yeah. I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, no, we, we really appreciate you. That was the last question. So I'd really like to thank you once again. And thank you for answering all of those questions. I, I, I need to find out how many there were. I, I could probably have told you, actually. Um, well, um, inspirational well just amazingly inspirational um, right. and for more inspiration um, all of our audience you can visit um, Brooke Jensen's um, website which is www.lenswork.com it's there on the screen now 
Um, we are sending out a special one month trial offer um, with our survey. Um, this will give you a link to um, the lens work for the free trial. Um, right. We also have a link to this recording, um, which it's going to be available in a day or two. Okay. Um, I'd also like to remind um, everybody um, that there's a 20% discount if you join the RPS before the 30th of September and you have viewed one of our, um, our events, which this is one of. So you can visit the um, website, the RPS website, which is also shown on the bottom of the screen. Um, at RPS Digital Imaging Group, we're so very glad you joined us for this event. Um, and thanks for coming along to our, this is our ninth online event. We now have many more in the pipeline. Um, and if you are, are an RPS member, you'll probably like to join the Digital Imaging Group as an online member, as this will also help you save money. Um, our next online event will be a talk by Brenda Tharp called Photography close to home, creatively seeing the world around you. And this is on Saturday, October the 17th. Um, same time, same place. And um, we look forward to seeing you again then. And stay safe, everybody, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.